56 million people will die this year. 4.6 million people will die this month. Um, 153,000 will die today. 6,000 people will die uh, in the next hour. Um, 107 people will die here in the next minute. And 1.8 um, will die in the second. Now, just, just think about, just think about that in, in totality. And when, you know, I got to thinking about this, you know, in the, this, this week, and, 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 but here's the problem. Death is the greatest problem that, that humanity has. It is the greatest problem that humanity has, but it's also a mystery that can be solved. And that mystery is revealed. And this, this complicated word that we call dispensation, you're going to, you're going to see that today. How God had a plan from all eternity, from Genesis to Revelation. It's so refreshing when we get to do a memorial, a funeral service, and just like Pam and Billy did the music yesterday with Lonnie's, and it was so beautiful. It was so beautiful. But when we know that that person is in Christ, it, it, is, it, it can truly be a celebration. And today in our Sunday school class, we, we talked about the new heaven and the new earth. And I will just tell you guys, it is revealed, this problem is revealed how it's solved through Christ Jesus. And the title of our sermon today is Captured by Christ, the Sacred Secret. And we're going to read, and in, in, in we're going to be in, we're back in our expository part in the book of Ephesians. And we're going to be in chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, the book of Ephesians, chapter, um, chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have already briefly written already, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Verse 5, when, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men as it has now and been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. And the Gentiles should be his fellow heirs of the same body and the same partaker of his promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we love you and we praise you. We hallow your name, and I thank you for this beautiful, beautiful word. And I just praise you, Lord, that we were captured, that I was captured by you. I praise you, Lord, for every person in this congregation that's been captured by you. I pray, Father, that there's somebody today that has not been captured by you. I pray that this be the day that the Holy Spirit arrives in their heart and the problem of death is solved in their life. I pray for this church, Lord. And I pray for the blessings. I pray that the, the church gets a word from you and not me. And Father, because I'm not worthy, I need your strength. I need your strength to give me this message, Lord. And Father, I just ask that you forgive the pastor because my sins are many. And God's, and God's people said... Okay, we're going to start here in verse, verse 1, and it says this, For I, Paul, everybody say prisoner with me, prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles. Now, I'm finding it amazing that Paul says, I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Because Paul, as you guys know, spent a long time in prison. <laughs> I'm just saying, right? He spent a long time in prison. And he was never in a prison. The church didn't keep him in prison. It was usually by the Roman guards. It always kept him in prison. In fact, he was in prison uh, uh, most of his adult life. But I want to, before we get to that part of it, I want you to understand that a couple of things. Number one, 
Paul is the only Jew in the Bible who began using a Gentile name. All right, now think about this for a second. All of us in this room are Gentiles. I don't know of any Jewish people here in the room, but we are all Gentiles. So when he talks about Gentiles, he's talking about me and you. Now here's what I want us to understand. Paul used to be called Saul. So he would become, uh, he'd be, be called Big Saul, okay, because that's who that would be in the Hebrew land. Everybody loved Saul. Everybody loved David. You know, Saul was the king before David. And then, uh, you know, then he tried to kill David and <laughs> the, whole, the whole ordeal with that. But Saul was thought up highly in the, the hierarchy of the Hebrew uh, uh, religion, okay? And, and, and he was big Saul, and he went to small Paul. Paul grew up as a very, very wealthy Roman Jew. He grew up in a very, very wealthy family. He grew up and he had the best uh, uh, schools, uh, he got to play, he got to go to the best basketball and football camps. He got, to, he got all the nice clothes. He got all the great training. Paul had everything you could ask for. When he got into his adult life, he, was, he went to the best schools in Jerusalem. He had it all. He, had, uh, he, he attended all the parties. He was the popular kid. <laughs> he got to date all the cheerleaders. He had everything. He had status beyond belief. He was one of the most high-powered lawyers uh, in Jerusalem. He would later be a Sadducee. You remember those guys? All right, he was a Pharisee. He was the chief of Pharisees. In fact, he was, he was so high up that they, in law enforcement, he would be like probably today like the director of the FBI or somebody like that. Okay, in that time, he was given the task of chasing down Christians. But here's the deal. He lost all of it, all of that, all of it went away. The day that he accepted Christ Jesus. That day that he had that experience when Jesus Christ captured him on Damascus Road. He captured him. He gave up everything, everything. The Bible states that he had to work as a tent maker to make ends meet because everybody shunned him. When he would go out on mission trips, he'd have to get odd jobs. Paul, then Paul would be when he wasn't making tents, wasn't trying to make ends meet just so he could eat. Paul was a man who spent most of his life, adult life, in prison. But he refers to himself as a prisoner of Christ. I want you guys to think about this for a second. Why would Jesus put him in jail? I mean, he's doing all this for him. Why, did we, why, why would Jesus do such a thing? Well, I'm going to tell you. Here's my, here's my hypothesis, hypothesis. First, Paul would become the most prolific writer in the history of mankind. Think about this. Do you guys know that there's 4 billion copies of this book that's been sold? 4 billion. Nothing's even come close. The Quran, what we talked about last week, I think there was like 500, or I'm uh, sorry, like maybe uh, 500 million copies of that, the Quran sold, but there's been 4 billion. Now, the, prim the predominant author in this book is who? Paul, right? Okay. And, and most of the time, he would have to put him in jail because Paul was so convicted. He was so, he was so immersed with the power of God from that time he had that experience on Damascus Road. Now, you just think about how God uses people. You know, Paul was probably, if he, most lawyers can do two things very well. I don't like lawyers that much, but most, most of us don't, but they do two things very well. They write and they speak very well. You know that. So if, if Paul was that guy, he was that good, okay? But the second reason that I think that Jesus put him in jail, okay, was, was to share the gospel with the Roman guards. Now you go, well, why would he share the gospel with the Roman guards? Well, he shared the gospel, but what was significant about the guards? Well, the guards in all these different places that he were in the Roman Empire, and not, not, not necessarily when he was in Rome, but he was in Rome when he, in, in a lot of these places, but, but the Roman Empire influences, these prisons that they would have across their empire were manned by retired soldiers and retired officers. These retired soldiers had families there. These retired soldiers had a lot of status 
And that's how they, that's how they, they put their soldiers into these statuses. Okay, and so they were retired military personnel, and they had considerable influence. And then what would happen is he would share the gospel with them, okay, in these Roman uh, in these Roman prisons, and it would strategically reveal the mystery that we're going to talk about today. But I'm going to ask you guys something. I've got to pray this often because I ask myself this. I think we all do. Would you give up everything? Your status, your, 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 your status that you've worked your whole life for, would you give up everything, everything? Would you give up everything for Christ right now if he asked you to? Everything. Would you go anywhere, any place, do any job? Would you do it? You've got to ask yourself, would you pray that prayer? Would you, when you pray, would you pray? Do you pray, God, whatever, it, whatever you want me to do? That's a hard prayer to make. That's a hard prayer to make because we, we, we like our status. We like our home. We like our wealth. We like our uh, things that we have. But if you, were, you would, would you leave behind everything, that precious time, that status, that wealth, if he called you to do so? Look what it says here. Look what Paul says here in verse 2. If indeed you have heard of, everybody say dispensation with me. Of the grace of God, which was given to me for you. See, we're going to talk about this term theologically, and I'd almost like to do a whole sermon on dispensation sometime. But after the fall of Adam and Eve, humanity lost its innocence. And God urged his, his people to use their divinely implanted conscience to do what's right. We all have a conscience, okay? But that marked the beginning of the second dispensation. Uh, period, and that lasted for about 1,600 years until God could no longer tolerate sin. And we talked about this last week, what happened. Remember what happened? The Noahic covenant was established because God destroyed the world. He saved those beautiful eight souls, and that was the first salvation when they got in the water and they got in the boat, and he had his rainbow, and, and that, was the, that, was the, that was considered the, 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 the first salvation. Okay, and then from those eight individuals he, that, that, that made the remnant, okay, that made the remnant, then you, you led to the Abrahamic covenant, and then you see the civil authority was stashed, uh, established then, okay. The new world order is what they called it in the Bible. Have you guys ever heard that before? A new world order, and then what happened? What happened? During the dispensation of the human government, and then remember what happened? And Genesis uh, chapter 1, verses 14, or I'm sorry, 14, verses 1, or 11, 11, 4. What happened? God said, let, let, us, let us go down and confuse our language, and you got the Tower of Babel. And who sues us? Us is the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Okay, so you remember all that part of it. Okay, so he, he broke up the new world order. Then God created the Hebrew people. From that, he created the Israelites and the Hebrew people. And he gave them the law through Moses and, and the Abrahamic covenant. They continued to break the law, and it was eventually fulfilled by Jesus Christ. That is the dispensation now of grace. And this is called the, the church age that we currently live in. And that was the same age that Paul lived in. Okay, Dispensation of grace is because of this era, era Jesus built this church. And now combined with the power of the Holy Spirit... We have a chance to be resurrected, and we have a chance to defeat this horrible, horrible thing in our lives today called death, and death is going to affect every single one of you. Death is going to affect every single one of your families, and it's going to be the most significant problem you will ever face here on this earth. But notice what he says here in verse 3, how that by the revelation he made known to me, the everybody say mystery with me, mystery. mystery. You see, this whole thing was a mystery. This mystery, okay? This mystery. Here's what you've got to understand, folks. In the Old Testament, Christ was concealed. In the New Testament, he's revealed. Can I get a witness? He's revealed in the New Testament. Do you understand that? And see, that's that mystery that he's talking about. Now, this, it's, that's that mystery now, this is how we solve this problem of death. Why? Ephesians had to ask this question. Now, if you're in Ephesus at the time, you have to ask this question. Why is Paul a prisoner 
Why, why are you guys following this clown? Why would you do that? This, this guy's been in jail on multiple occasions. Well, you going to let your kids go to, go see this guy named Paul? Would you let your teenagers go see the guy that's the guy named Paul? Would you let him see? I mean, this guy's in jail all the time. Why would you let him go see him? He's crazy. He's talking, he's some jailbird clown who's talking about this guy that came back to life after an execution. Now, you think about how crazy this thing, this mystery that Paul's revealing would be. He explained the situation here. You see what he said to me, the mystery I've briefly uh, I've already written. And the context, the mystery, is that church. And that mystery is now Jesus Christ is revealed. It's not some spooky concept. It's a truth that was concealed in the past but now is revealed. Now, when you take that word mystery, okay, and you translate it, mysterion is the Greek word. You know what that translated for? The sacred secret. Okay? The sacred secret. Now, think about it. You guys got the Rosetta Stone for life, and that mystery is answered, and that problem of death is solved. Yet every, there, but 1.8 seconds, one, every, every, every second, 1.8 will die. Remember the stats, 56 million will die this year. How many out of that 56 million knows that mystery? Probably very, very few. Heaven's not going to be a big place, folks, unfortunately. It's not, and it's so sad when you think about it. And how many pastors will come up here in a pulpit, uh, you know, and you go to a funeral, as well, or not pastors, but people will just say after the funeral, well, you know, brother, he's in a better place. And I've heard people say that about people I know that aren't saved. They're not in a better place. The, the, the death is there, that sacred secret, okay? But we know that sacred secret. But look here what he says here in verse 4. By which when you read, you may understand the knowledge of the mystery of Christ. There's no area in the Christian life where in all of our lives that is not influenced by this sacred secret. The sacred secret falls into some general categories. Yeah, it deals with salvation. And that is a very, very beautiful gift. And that solves the problem of death forever. And it's, it's eternal life. But you also get another, you also get revealed another secret while you're here on earth. And that's called the Holy Spirit. Because the second that you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, what happens? The Holy Spirit comes in you, and he resides with your soul now. And King Jesus marks you. He marks you on behalf of King Jesus, and he says he belongs to you. You now are a child of the King. That gift of the Holy Spirit, he's our hope. And that same power, that resurrection that resurrected Jesus Christ someday will resurrect your body. But notice what he says here in verse 5 which in the other ages was not made known for the sons of men, but now he has been revealed by the Spirit, his holy apostles and prophets. Just like I said, Jesus is concealed in the Old Testament, and now he's revealed in the New Testament. The birth, but here's the sacred secret. It's that birth that you have, that new birth. You see, that's not just a metaphor. That, that you, you, are, you are alive in Christ. That birth is in the spiritual domain. You are birthed just like, a, just like a mother gives birth to her child. Except for this, this body is imperishable. This is a seed that's imperishable. 1 Peter 1.4 says, It's an imperishable, undefiled, unfading inheritance kept in heaven for you. That seed, that spiritual seed is imperishable. Remember last week, it all started at the Noahic Covenant. That first salvation, which then led to the Abrahamic covenant. As with any birth, the baby has the nature of the parent. And now your new nature of that parent and that new life in Christ, okay, we are the partakers of the divine nature. You see where he says that partakers of the divine nature. Because every Christian is born of a spiritual seed. Every single Christian. There's a new divine, and you never have to worry about death from that point on, ever ever therefore if anyone is in christ he is a new creation and the old has gone and the new has come second corinthians 5 17 says each new baby is a new creation i got to do a funeral in a place called carnegie oklahoma on tuesday 
What was so fascinating about this funeral is, is a, a friend of mine, uh, an old army friend, she, uh, her and her husband um, had, um, uh, had befriended this, this 80-year-old man at a supermarket in Carnegie, okay? Just out of the blue one day. They were at a supermarket in Carnegie picking up some stuff. They didn't live in Carnegie. He had some relatives over there. They had to pick up something. Found this old man, wasn't in good shape. They befriended him, okay? And uh, they got to know him. He didn't have a lot. He was a veteran. Next thing you know, they're kind of helping him out. And they're trying to help him out with the VA. He didn't have any VA benefits and what have you. Nonetheless, to make a, the, the, a long story short, um, the, they took, got, got into a doctor. He wasn't feeling good. And the doctor said, you've got about six months to live. That was in 2010. Okay. All right. And, and her husband uh, would, would, would go and visit him. They got him set up in the VA center. And they he'd, he'd go visit him all the time. And he would share the gospel and share the gospel and share the gospel and share the gospel. And he said, no, no. No, no. Thirteen years later, he said yes. Okay. He accepted Jesus Christ at 93. <laughs> Amen. He accepted Christ at 93, but it took 13 years of a man coming in a family that had no kin whatsoever. Thirteen years. That's how God works for him to get that mystery. So just, he died at 96, he accepted Christ at 93. In his last three years of his life, he loved Jesus, he lived for Jesus. And what, what if he would have died at 1980 and didn't have that divine appointment, or at, not at 80, not 1980, but in 2010 when the doctor said he would, but Jesus had other plans. Jesus Christ captured him. Captured him. That's what's so amazing. It's amazing. But let's go to let's go to verse uh, let's go to verse uh, six here. Let's go to verse six. That Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and the partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. Okay. So 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 we have, you know, we talked about having perishable bodies, and we're gonna die in dishonor with those perishable bodies without Christ. But the natural body we have and the spiritual body is a revelation like you cannot imagine. We talked in our Sunday school class today how awesome heaven's going to be in the new Jerusalem and the new earth. But here's what we should be thankful for, that we are partakers in that promise. You see, we are on the same status now as Jesus Christ because his spirit lives with us. So his glory is our glory. And that's how we get to share it here. And Paul presents this truth as a mystery and reveals that believing Gentiles, because there were Gentiles in Ephesus, okay, now they're coming. And now they have a new excellent relationship with Jesus Christ. And remember, we are Gentiles. And we, uh, this is offered no matter what you've done, what your crime is, how many times you have sinned in your life. We are fellow heirs with Jesus Christ. And, and God gave you them because of his covenant with who? Abraham, you remember the Abrahamic covenant, why the land matters, and if you were in Christ, and you're Abraham's offspring, and you're heirs with Jesus Christ. And that was the promise of Galatians 3.29. In Christ, being a Jew or a Gentile is neither an asset nor it's a liability. Because we share the righteousness in Christ. We share all of it. Let's go to verse 7. Of which I became a minister according to the gift of grace of God, given to me by the effective working of his, everybody say this word with me, power. You talk about a mystery to solve. Guys, we, we've never, and I talk about this, believe it or not, I'm writing a book about this right now, and uh, got about eight chapters. I've been writing this for like three years now. Just don't ever have time to finish it, but that's okay. But I'm going to get it done one of these days. But uh, power, the, the power that we have, and nobody understood this more than big Saul, little Paul. He understood this power like nobody. And you remember what the resurrected Jesus Christ said before he descended in heaven for the last time? But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit of God comes upon you, and you will be my witness in Judea and Samaria all the days of your life. 
and to the end of the earth. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Before he ascended into heaven, Jesus explained to the disciples that he would not be physically present with them. I'm not going to be with you anymore, but I'm going to give you something better. That's called the power, and the power is from the Holy Spirit. And you have that power when you're using it for his will and his glory. Every single one of you that's accepted Christ, you get that power. Being baptized in the Holy Spirit is what he promised, and it's promised for every one of you. And in closing, Jesus, that power, that Holy Spirit power, is that mystery revealed from the time of Genesis to the time of Revelation. We all have the pleasure who have accepted him of being a slave for Jesus Christ. The problem of death is solved. by the. You see that word here. By the effective working of his power. That's a beautiful revelation of my book. That is that sacred secret that all of you will have possessed if you receive him. But here's the sad reality, folks. Most people won't. I told you the other day, there's only two types of people in this world. They're the lost and they're the saved. That's it. There's no black people or white people or red people or brown people or Asian or Hispanic or Irish or whatever. No. There's not Israelis or Hamas. You guys remember that? They're lost or you're saved. With every head bowed and all eyes closed. You know, Father, we just, we thank you. We don't understand that power. We don't understand that power that, that, that you have in us today. But I'm going to pray right now, Father, that there's somebody here in the room or there's somebody that's never accepted you as Lord and they want that power and they want to defeat death forever and never have to worry about death. Never, ever have to worry about death. I pray right now, Lord, that you, you bring the Holy Spirit of God right here in this sanctuary and come upon them. Capture them, Lord, with your power. And Father, there's somebody watching online today. It's not hard. Admit to Jesus Christ that you are a sinner. Repent. Believe that he was indeed the Son of God and he died, he was buried, and he was resurrected on the third day. And then you got to commit to him forever and ever. And if you never prayed that prayer, I'm ready to pray that prayer with you. Father, we love you and we praise you. And we ask these things in your blessed name. Amen.